Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We are allowing a minute for people to enter the webinar. I want to thank you for joining us very much today for the launch of WWF's report, Assessing Portfolio Impacts, Tools to Measure Biodiversity and SDG Footprints of Financial Portfolios. My name is Margaret Kulo. I'm the Global Finance Practice Leader of WWF, and I have the pleasure of introducing the report today and the team who put it together and then moderating our discussion. It's great to see the broad interest in this report and more importantly in these tools. We have registrants from the finance and corporate sectors as well as think tanks, ESG data providers, NGOs, and academia. A few housekeeping items just before we get started. Our webinar today will be 90 minutes. It will be recorded. If you'd like to view or share it after today's event, the recording along with the presentation used today will be available on our website and we'll provide the link in the chat. Speaking of which, the chat function is disabled for attendees to use. If you would like to submit a question, to our presenters or to our panelists, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. We hope to have some time near the end of the panel conversation for some audience questions. So again, go ahead and click on that Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. When we started scoping this project, we had one simple question. In a world of increasing information on ESG, where should we focus? We were interested in learning what ESG, environment, social governance related ratings and reporting might mean to the health of our planet. We wanted to understand how we might address concerns about greenwashing or impact washing. And this led us naturally to focus on impacts. On the one hand, how financial institutions can measure and report on the environmental impact of their finance and investment activities at the portfolio level. And on the other hand, how investors and asset managers might use such impact information. Obviously, it's not just us at WWF thinking about how to measure impact. Investors have also started to care more about the environmental and social impacts of their investments. And thanks to the mainstreaming of ESG, more data has become available, both from increased corporate reporting and external third-party data providers. We've also begun to see impact assessment tools and methodologies, including those focusing not just on climate, but tools focused on assessing biodiversity impact. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were excited to be part of the launch of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. That launch reflected an effort that brought together financial institutions, corporates, data providers, rating agencies, governments, regulators, multilaterals, and NGOs, to shape and scope this new initiative. Built on the experience of the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD, over the course of the next two years, the TNFD will deliver a framework for organizations to report and act on evolving nature-related risks and opportunities. In order to support the shift in global financial flows away from nature-negative outcomes and toward nature-positive outcomes. Nature-related risks and opportunities refer not only to the short-term financial risks, but also to those longer-term risks that arise through a company's impact and their dependencies on nature. That's quite relevant for the discussion we'll have today. Our report, Assessing Portfolio Impacts, focuses on tools currently available to help financial institutions assess at the portfolio level impacts on biodiversity, on the environment, and more broadly for some of these tools on achieving the sustainable development goals. Before we hear more from the authors of the report, I want to highlight two important points. First, the report looks explicitly at how to assess the environmental impacts of investment as opposed to the environmental risks of investment. And second, the report focuses on tools that enable such assessment at the portfolio level as opposed to the level of the individual assessment. Now with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the co-authors of report, Joanne Lee and Sam Hilton. I'd ask them to join me here on the virtual stage. Joanne Lee is a global sustainable finance specialist with WWF. She provides technical guidance and thought leadership on various topics, including net zero portfolio alignment, 
green financial solutions, sustainable infrastructure finance, and natural capital. She was the project manager for this report and brought us all to here uh, together today also for this discussion. Sam Hilton has been our consultant on this project. Sam was previously a senior research analyst for environmental finance with WWF Hong Kong, and he brings years of professional experience in financial services. And with that, I'd like to welcome Joanne and Sam to share the findings of the report. Thank you very much, Margaret. Sam, would you like to share the screen? Great. All right, thank you, Margaret, for the introduction. Finally, after months of work, I'm very pleased to be here with you all today to share the findings from our report, Assessing Portfolio Impacts, Tools to Measure Biodiversity and SDG Footprints of Financial Portfolios. Next slide, please. The content, table of content. Yes, uh, in terms of content, I'll take you through the first few slides to introduce the purpose and scope of our work, then hand over to Sam, who will present various impact assessment tools for portfolio investors. And he's going to also talk a little bit about the case studies. And I will take it back to wrap up the last slide um, on recommendations. Next slide. So um, as Margaret mentioned in her opening remarks, we started this work in an attempt to connect sustainable investing to its impacts on the ground. The question we asked ourselves was, to what extent ESG or sustainable, responsible investing truly helping to achieve environmental and societal goals? This is what we are here trying to do, find out from this project. Next slide. Although this is relatively new, there is a momentum for integrating impact. On the regulatory standpoint, there is an increase in requiring investors to disclose more ESG information generally, and there is an increasing interest from the investor community in measuring impacts beyond assessing risks. I will mention this again in the next slide when I explain about the scope of our research. And when it comes to impacts, we, re we recognize the growing private sector interest in protecting nature and biodiversity. So we became curious about what impacts financial portfolios have on biodiversity. Also, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals added an explicit impact orientation to the sustainable investing domain making it more feasible for investors to target their impacts to align with the SDGs. We noticed that many mainstream investors are either already doing this assessment or interested in doing it. Next slide, please. So it was clear that we wanted to really focus on impact measurement tools that allow investors and asset managers to assess impact at a portfolio level with global scope and good coverage of sectors and companies. When I say portfolio level, I mean tools that allow a financial portfolio with different asset classes as an input to the tool. If a tool can assess corporate impacts, but does not aggregate them at a portfolio level as a main function, we didn't prioritize it. We paid attention to the tools that disclose their methodologies in a transparent manner with reasonable public disclosure. We noticed that some data providers are offering impact assessment as part of a paid subscription or membership or as a customized service, which is great, but we consider such cases as a client-based service rather than a tool that is at least partially automated upon providing user input. We prioritize tools that measure and assess impacts that result from their investment and portfolio management decisions, particularly with respect to the SDGs, the environment in general, and biodiversity in particular. In our report, you'll see in-depth analysis on how each of the selected tools performs, their methodologies, and very interestingly, how the tools visualize impact results. And if you see the column on the right side, I listed some other types of tools that we are aware of, but were left outside uh, the scope for this particular research. This out of scope tools um, um, include those which aim to assess climate or biodiversity risks and dependencies or tools that focus on net zero target setting or portfolio alignment, tools that focus um, measure impacts only at a project level or measure only the positive impacts achieved from impact investing. We also didn't include tools that help assess company revenue alignment with sustainability taxonomy or SDGs. 
Now with that, I hope that gave you a clear idea about the scope of the research and which kind of tools that we are focusing on. Now I'll hand it over to Sam to guide us through the tools that we examined. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Joanne. We conducted an initial scan that identified over 50 tools, services, databases, methodologies, and frameworks that had at least some connection to impact. Using the filtering approach that Joanne talked about in the previous slide, we found that the 12 tools and services on this slide were the closest fit for the requirements we had in mind. But we plotted these tools on this grid where the x-axis focuses on uh, the assessment level. Most of the 12 tools focus on portfolio level impact assessment with some providing company level assessments as well, and just a couple focus on, uh, on location. Uh, the y-axis is for the assessment focus. This is split into tools focusing on biodiversity specifically, the environment more generally, and holistic tools that focus on various themes derived from the SDGs or ESG factors. In terms of measurement type, as you can see from the chart, the biodiversity footprint tools provide absolute measurements, while the holistic tools tend to measure impact footprints relative to a benchmark. From this roster of tools and services, we relegated uh, five to our honorable mention category, which is in the annex of the report, and focused on uh, the seven tools and services listed on the next slide. For assessment focus on this table, of the main tools we looked at in the report, three of them are focused on biodiversity, one on the general environment, uh, and three are holistic tools, which are specifically focused on uh, the sustainable development goals. For assessment targets, these range from companies to portfolios. And for these tools, portfolio as used here typically means listed asset investment portfolios, but some of the tools are also able to assess portfolios of other asset classes. Bank-oriented tools that look at uh, a bank's balance sheet or specific business lines may also incorporate assessments of companies or portfolios or both. Uh, impact measurement type for these tools is either absolute or relative to a benchmark and ease of use basically deals with automation levels. For example, a fully automated tool would let me upload an investment portfolio and maybe a chosen benchmark and then produce the relevant output relatively instantly, while the results for a partially automated tool may take some time produce, to produce and require additional effort from the user. Given the makeup of this population of tools and services, we chose to conduct case studies on two biodiversity specific tools and two SDG or holistic tools highlighted in green on the table. Our case studies were a straightforward exploration of what the output of the tools looked like given a hypothetical sample portfolio. For this, we generated a 10 name portfolio from the agri-food subsector of the GICS uh, before I provide some quick highlights of the metrics used by the two sets of tools, let me say that within each category, while the tools certainly have commonalities, they and their outputs are not directly comparable with each other, as they take somewhat different approaches to the data and metrics uh, that they use. The biodiversity tools employ similar methodologies and use company financials and, and other disclosed data, plus various open source scientific databases to provide an absolute measure of a portfolio's biodiversity footprint using a metric called mean species abundance, which is an indicator of biodiversity intactness. The two tools provide differing levels of granularity with the corporate biodiversity footprint covering four environmental pressures, while the biodiversity impact analytics tool covers five terrestrial and five freshwater pressures subcategorized by dynamic impacts occurring within the period assessed and static or persistent impacts. The holistic tools both measure the SDG footprint of a portfolio relative to a chosen index. In our case, we chose the MSCI World Index, typically using company, company disclosures, i.e. financials and ESG data, and potentially data from third-party sources. The Portfolio Impact Footprint tool provides its output along 15 ESG and SDG aligned factors, while the Sustainable Investment Framework Navigator tool has condensed the SDGs into six thematic factors. Both tools focus on data that is objectively measurable rather than subjective. In terms of environmental factors, this includes metrics for waste generated, freshwater used, and greenhouse gas emissions. For the biodiversity tools, I will note uh, that at the time of the case study, neither tool covered all 10 companies in our sample portfolio, so we made some substitutions. As both tools have been continuing to expand their coverage, I doubt this would be an issue for the sample portfolio now. Regarding the strengths and limitations, well, actually, first, let me say we're not going to get into each tool uh, 
specifically in detail uh, uh, and what their output says be, just because uh, there is not enough time in a 90 minute webinar but so we'll we'll jump straight to the um, to the meat um, this regarding the strengths and limitations of the two categories of tools we looked at in the case studies one overarching point is that data is highly varied in both quality and availability for all of these tools and improving the data that they use is probably the biggest challenge the tools face. A key strength for the biodiversity tools is their methodological transparency and the credibility of the various open source scientific databases they use to incorporate environmental pressures from across a given company's value chain into their footprint calculation. The fact that they are fully automated makes them easy to use from an investor's perspective. And while a motivated investor could in theory replicate the tool's outputs, even a portfolio of just 50 names would require a significant amount of effort over an extended period of time. The biggest limitations of these tools relate to data and coverage. While a baseline assessment of a company can be generated fairly quickly using their financials from company disclosure and the sector and country averages for the environmental environmental pressures stemming from that company's value chain from the scientific databases. This means that without company specific site level data, two companies with similar activities in the same countries will have similar results from a given tool, even if they are operating in very different local environments within each country. In terms of coverage, beyond the short-term company coverage limitations, uh, as I discussed earlier, the scientific databases they use are also limited in their coverage. They currently provide limited to no coverage of key topics such as marine biodiversity, invasive species, and overexploitation, and the resolution of their geographical coverage varies, with some countries covered at the country level and others grouped into smaller or larger regions. Finally, while biodiversity is increasingly prominent as a topic for the financial sector, it is still unfamiliar to many investors. It may be challenging to attract serious interest from the mainstream without significant efforts to boost awareness and understanding of the concepts involved. For the holistic tools, key strengths include their coverage, their developers' methodological transparency, ease of use, and accessibility, and in particular for accessibility, thanks to the long-term development of ESG and sustainability reporting and investing, the concepts the tools engage with and the sources of data they use are already familiar to mainstream investors. Data is also a key limitation, however, as ESG data disclosure is unstandardized and typically unaudited and takes place under a variety of reporting frameworks. In addition, what is reported may vary by company. Another limitation is the limited coverage of environmental issues, water waste and greenhouse gas emissions. This is primarily an issue of data availability and corporate disclosure. Finally, since both holistic tools compare impacts relative to a benchmark, the results depend greatly on the benchmark chosen. This relative context needs to be highlighted when discussing a portfolio or funds impact footprint. Otherwise, it is easy to conceive of a situation where a benchmark with particularly negative impacts is chosen in order to make a portfolio look better than it actually is. We have grouped the many potential applications for biodiversity and SDG footprinting tools into three basic categories, compare, identify, and disclose. For compare, they can be used to compare a portfolio's footprint against other funds or portfolios, against various benchmarks, and even potentially against itself over time. From an identification standpoint, financial institutions can use them as a screen in portfolio construction or rebalancing to identify priority candidates for corporate engagement or to identify key environmental or social indicators to reduce impacts. <clears throat> in terms of disclosure, it is easy to conceive of fund managers using the disclosure of the footprints of their sustainability themed funds as a marketing tool or as a way to demonstrate the validity of their sustainability claims and thus reduce their vulnerability to accusations of uh, something like sustainability washing. I think we've already talked about greenwashing and impact washing. Relatedly, the footprint disclosure could be used as part of the certification process for thematic funds. Finally, from a regulatory perspective, as some jurisdictions are beginning to incorporate some form of impact disclosure into the regulatory framework, the outputs of these tools might be able to help meet these requirements. With that, I hand you back to Joanne to talk about recommendations. Thanks, Sam. Yes, so, so what are the recommendations to tool providers, financial institutions, and regulators? First, we suggest tool providers who are also on the, on, uh, with us in the panel to conduct research and add more scientific database and metrics to also consider ways to harmonize and standardize the metrics and language they use to measure and present their output. And third, to work towards investor education and raise awareness. 
And as you've seen in the previous slide, we recommend financial institutions to use these impact assessment tools as they incorporate impact into their investment decision-making process, start disclosing environmental impacts of financial portfolios, and compare the results over time and use them in company engagement. Finally, we would like to encourage regulators and policymakers to encourage financial institutions to use robust and credible impact assessment tools, add impact measurement to the current focus on environmental risk analysis in the network for greening the financial system, and encourage or even require impact disclosure in financial products or more transparent disclosure of impact assessment methodologies. So, and, and our key ask for all is to really use these impact assessment tools for reporting and support the development of expanded corporate data disclosure. Next slide, please. So in the beginning of my presentation, I showed you the question we asked ourselves before conducting this research. And I would like to end the presentation with this short statement. It's time to turn towards the impact of financial portfolios on the environment and society because investors deserve to know what is truly sustainable. The impact assessment tools we showcased are still in the early stage. Therefore, they're not perfect and they all need to be improved rapidly in terms of its usability, data and company coverage. But we believe that investors will be better informed and better equipped with the results from these tools because in the end, what we want to see is more positive and less negative impacts on the ground from investment. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Margaret. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna and Sam. Uh, this is a great foundation for the panel discussion that we're going to begin in just a minute. Um, and I think it's important to, um, to point out that this report was not an effort to do rating or ranking of various tools. It was, it was an effort to look at what tools are available if you want to understand as an investor um, what the impact uh, might be of your portfolio, um, and also um, looking at both specifically the impacts, the environmental impacts, and uh, at the portfolio level. So um, great foundation. We want to thank you both very much for this research. There have been some questions already in the Q&A. You can feel free to start to add questions. Uh, use the Q&A button on the bottom. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and we will make the webinar and the um, publication as well as links that to all of these tools that we've been um, putting in the uh, chat for you and in the q a um, those will all be available after the webinar as well so uh, with that i would like to introduce our panelists uh, i'm very excited to moderate this conversation uh, with experts who bring extensive experience in this relatively new field of impact assessment and i invite you to uh, turn your video on either now or as i um, introduce you on to uh, Sivalasco is head of research for Impact Cubed, a company providing investment impact measurement services. He's been doing environmental, social, and governance research in the context of responsible investment for over 15 years. And before Impact Cube was head of ESG research EMEA for MSCI ESG research. Uh, Leonie J uh, Jesse is Associate Director at KPMG Sustainability, focusing on the financial sector. She supports organizations in the implementation of the Sustainable Finance Action Plan and advises on ESG integration and responsible investing. Jesse's the initiator of KPMG's collaboration with the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Many of you on the webinar, I'm sure, know CISL, uh, and, uh, and also the development of the Sustainable Investment Framework Navigator. Marianne Vincent is CEO of Carbon for Finance. Uh, she joined after 15 years in the financial industry in various positions from strategy to risk management to business development, strongly committed to tackling ESG issues. And over the last five years, she supported institutional clients in incorporating ESG criteria in portfolio management and reporting. Mathieu Moen is co-founder of the Iceberg Data Lab, a European fintech specialized in ESG data solutions with a strong focus on biodiversity and climate. Uh, prior Prior to that, Matthew was the CEO of a climate data provider, worked for BNP Paribas, so some banking also in the background, and he's a member of the technical hub of the Align project. Karin Ab leads UNEP FI, the UNEP Finance Initiative's SDG and Impact Workstream. Through the Positive Impact Initiative, uh, PI, perhaps the best acronym we'll get to for the day because everyone loves 
Principles Pi. Since the release of the Principles for Positive Impact in 2017, she's published multiple reports and managed the development of a unique holistic impact me management methodology, uh, including the release of two tools just in 2020, the Portfolio Impact Anal Analysis Tool for Banks, and a corporate impact analysis tool. And Ladislas uh, Smia is head of sustainability research at Mihova, an affiliate of Nataxis Investment Managers dedicated to uh, sustainable investment. He's participated in the creation of the company and has worked in development of the internal impact methodology and assessment tools. And before joining Mihova, he worked uh, for PwC as a state sustainability consultant. So I want to thank you all again for joining us. Uh, we have uh, probably 100 years experience in ESG and impact measurement across the panel. So I'm really looking forward to a good conversation. And I want to start with a quick question for you all. Let's just sort of go around the room. This is really hard work, this impact measurement, how you get the data, what you measure. What brings you to assessing ESG impacts? How do you come to this field? Um, maybe I can start in the reverse order in which I introduce you. So Ladislas, why don't you start us off? Sorry. Uh, well, for us, of course, as you say, we are dedicated to uh, sustainability. So it's very important for us to look at sustainability uh, as a whole. And uh, of course, we are focusing on climate change for quite a while, but biodiversity for us seems to be uh, well, it's already something that we took into account, but we believe that we need to increase the focus that we put historically. And that's something that we are doing with uh, our peers, with the industry and trying to develop a market about the data, about how to improve the way we, we tackle that, we take that into consideration. So this is uh, really something that we do. And we believe that this will require a lot of innovation by investing in new kind of asset, but maybe we'll come, that, come back to that later. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great way to start. Um, Karin. Thank you so, so much, Margaret. Um, I think for UNEP Finance Initiative, um, this has been a, a very important step. Um, we've been working with financial institutions globally for 30 years now. And uh, as, uh, as you know, um, sustainability and the intersection with finance really starts um, with a risk um, focus, but ultimately as the UN, our focus is the 2030 agenda, it's the SDGs. And uh, it became very clear at some point that unless we really worked back from the end result that we're trying to achieve, which is basically impacts and achieving positive impacts and reducing negative impacts, um, that would not be enough. Um, but the big challenge, of course, is how to bring that into the mainstream. And so there we definitely saw a, a big gap um, of, you know, how do we indeed address um, impacts in, in mainstream finance? Um, so this is something we, uh, uh, that was really a, a key motivation for us to, to try and uh, achieve the UN's um, goals, but in the context very specifically of the mainstream. Uh, Matthew? Thank you, Margaret. Well, first, hello to everyone and congratulations to WWF for that great and comprehensive report. So to answer your question, uh, what led me personally to, to that field? Uh, simple, my, my previous experience as a banker, where a part of my job was to integrate uh, environmental consideration into the lending decision making process. Uh, and we couldn't rely on what the company reported. Uh, otherwise, it would have um, be unfavorable to the most transparent one. And the realization that we, we just lacked the data and the tools to do that. And so uh, I decided to dedicate my efforts to develop that kind of tool, which is what we do at Iceberg. Well, thank you. Marianne? I think you're on mute. Um, so Carbon for Finance is a, it's a French um, data provider uh, created uh, at the beginning in 2016 to provide investors with a complete set of uh, climate data solutions. And then we strongly believe that climate change and biodiversity loss as interlinked as must be tackled together. That's why last year we, we entered into a strategic partnership with CDC Biodiversity um, to leverage on their biodiversity uh, expertise and our uh, climate uh, data databases to build the biodiversity footprint tools for investors because we believe that's 
that's uh, very important for the financial uh, world to um, to take into account the biodiversity loss uh, as well as the climate change uh, issue. So our new database, um, Biodiversity Impact Analytics, that will help investors to uh, to assess these portfolios and to integrate biodiversity loss into their decisions. That's why we we are very committed to uh, to address both issues at Carbon Finance. Thank you. I think we'll we'll come back to this question during our discussion on investor demand in particular. It's a good, good flag. Leonie, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Um, well, I totally agree that assessing impact is hard indeed. Uh, but I have a background in uh, in asset management and banking, and I knew that there was a demand among asset managers to say something reasonable about the impact of investments on society. Uh, the simple question, does my portfolio do harm or good? And when I joined KPMG, I was impressed uh, by the methodologies that we already had in place to measure and even monetize the impact on a company level. Uh, but these methodologies were too complicated to use on a portfolio level. So when we found out about the sustainable investment framework that the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership had developed, uh, we were very enthusiastic um, and mainly because of the pragmatic approach they, they took. Uh, have we all know that we are dealing, it is, has been said already and it will be <laughs> during the, and we are dealing with many challenges uh, when it comes to impact measurement. Uh, but the people from Cambridge University said, let's just start off a creative framework uh, that's based on what we can measure today. And, and we cooperated with uh, CISL to, to build a framework, uh, to build a tool around the framework, uh, mainly with one goal to make it easier for, for asset managers to use the framework that they had developed uh, with the ultimate goal to become uh, the standard in the industry. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. We'll probably come back to that point on the uh, industry standards for sure. Antti, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. And thank, thank you, WWF, for putting the report together. It's a fantastic report and also very, very topical. Um, so Impact Cube is, a, um, is a first and foremost an asset management company. So we were a very mission-driven, very ESG and impact-heavy, impact-driven asset management company um, running various different ESG and impact portfolios over the years. Um, we were on the market for a, for a measurement tool and we couldn't find one that would satisfy the, uh, I suppose, a little bit picky criteria. So we developed our own. Um, that was um, many, many years ago. We've gone through a kind of a series of few dozen workshops in three continents and quite extensive pilot program before bringing the impact cubed uh, portfolio impact measurement tool to the, uh, tool to the market. Um, market. Um, ultimately, our mission is to, is to facilitate the um, um, uh, the capital allocation for a, for a flourishing planet. Um, and we very firmly believe that the, every investment decision um, has an impact. Um, um, that impact can be measured. Um, if it can be measured, then it can be managed. And if, the, if we would only have a kind of a larger part of the financial markets, kind of a, not only measuring, but managing the impact of their investment decisions, we would be in a, in a much, much better place. That's what brings us to the impact measurement specific. Uh, thanks for that. I want to start off with a with a question just to to maybe Marianne that comes off of a point that you just made too, Auntie. Why do footprint tools matter? Right, we're because we're, because a number of you have mentioned the difference between the things that you've looked at that help um, a, an investor think about one particular uh, corporate, but but why do you care or why do we want uh, tools for for footprint? To give a bit of context, um, so um, for biodiversity to be uh, a sustainable foundation of a global economy, uh, we really need to understand uh, the dynamics, the risk of opportunities of biodiversity. Uh, and to do so, we need an understanding on how biodiversity and the economy interact and how this interaction can be managed and measured. So that's why we come to this biodiversity footprint, because to build this understanding, it requires reliable data, robust data, that measures the impacts on biodiversity and to make sure that these data are available and ready for use for the financial sector. So the objective of developing this biodiversity footprint tool is to give more weight 
to biodiversity aspects in financial decision making in order to steer global financing flow from negative to positive effects on biodiversity. See that uh, it's very difficult for a financial actor, an economic actor, a company um, to understand uh, our current business model impact nature and how to measure uh, the biodiversity footprint of impact of companies and portfolios on biodiversity. So we use uh, a methodological tools, huh, the MSA metric, MSA for mean species abundance. It's a way to calculate biodiversity footprint, and they will create the conditions to incorporate these biodiversity impacts into investment decision making. So it will help to better understand the business model of corporates and to have a, a macro level understanding at your portfolio for investors. One of the recommendations that uh, is in the report is for the tool providers and, and investors on the demand side to look at better incorporation of these kinds of science-based tools. Um, is, is, is the, is the um, mean species abundance, that MSA data point, sort of how, how would you describe that as, you know, as compared to the other sort of science-based metrics that you can find right now in terms of the usability as you bring it into a tool? Sure. So um, we, well, we use the, the GBS methodology, the Global Biodiversity Score, and the output is the, is the MSA because uh, this metric is based on uh, the PBL agency. Uh, Globio, the Globio model, which accounts of uh, some uh, pressures on biodiversity. So there was a, like a, a decision to use this metric and this model because uh, there's a lot of scientific uh, like uh, consultation about this uh, this model, and we work with a lot of think tanks uh, uh, at inter international level to make sure that uh, the methodology is transparent and can be shared and challenged uh, by all the communities. Uh, so uh, the objective of that is try to understand the financial uh, activity of a company to translate that into some pressure on biodiversity. So we work on terrestrial pressure and aquatic pressure, and then convert that into biodiversity impacts. So it relies on a lot of scientific uh, and um, environmental metrics. Uh, so uh, we already uh, discussed and uh, leveraged on a lot of uh, different uh, databases and methodology to, to constitute this uh, biodiversity impact. Uh, but uh, we can always extend that. So for example, uh, we cover some uh, aquatic but freshwater pressure uh, because as of today, we think that we still lack some uh, um, uh, scientific data on marine biodiversity on the ocean. Uh, but as soon as we get some more and more information and more scientific data, we can extend uh, the methodology to, uh, to more pressure on biodiversity. So uh, you're right, huh? we can always work on some more uh, scientific background and collaborate more because uh, there's a lot of initiatives, uh, uh, open source uh, platform, etc work on biodiversity as well. And we try to, to work with a lot of them to make sure that we have integrated the most of uh, what's available on biodiversity as of today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, want to, um, I want to come back on this question of investor demand. I want to go to Matthew and to um, Ladislas as well. But uh, just before that, just to plant a seed for you, Karine, I like the mention in particular of the freshwater and the marine issues because a lot of times the 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 impacts that we're looking at are talking about are are, are terrestrial, um, and we do we do frequently see that the the freshwater issues or the marine issues uh, tend to get forgotten. So maybe we'll come back to that um, um, to you, Karim, when we talk a little bit more about the SDG tools. But first, uh, Matthew, and then to Ladislas. Um, what does the investor demand or appetite look like right now for uh, impact in assessment tools? Thank you, Margaret. Uh, well, first of all, I, I would say that the attendance uh, at this presentation uh, pay a testimony to the interest of uh, the financial institutions. We, we do see uh, global uh, initiatives. Huh? Uh, we have uh, 50. Last time I looked, uh, participant to the to the TNFD, which are financial institutions. Uh, you have the, the local uh, Dutch initiative, the PBF, which gathered 16 Dutch institutions and five other European institutions. Uh, when uh, Mirova 
Sycomore, AXA, and BNPM launched and tendered uh, a year ago about Bayard Steel's metrics. It came with an investor statement which gathered 30 signatories. Uh, so there is a momentum uh, where you see basically leaders of the sustainable, uh, in the, uh, the sustainable industry, the sustainable investment industry, broadly speaking, and also the, the largest players, uh, which know that basically this is a systemic risk uh, and, and this is something which, which must be factored in, in terms of risk management, accountability, stewardship, and also a value creation driver. And so that's what is fascinating in the in the use case that we see uh, at uh, at the, the, the clients that we have, uh, where where we see uh, 15 different I would say uh, use cases, um, we which are um, looking at that from the research angle, working on uh, investment thesis, risk management, uh, and so on. See if it can be embedded into broader environmental or ESG metrics. Uh, reporting, uh, we have a client, uh, CNP Assurance, which, which widely publicized, uh, published, excuse me, uh, a footprint on a part of its portfolio uh, expressed in, in MSA using our data. Another one is uh, already engaging uh, using that kind of data set. And, and last but not least, some of them are already considering that uh, what the signal says in terms of materiality and risk is already sound enough to uh, be a value creation driver. And, and therefore, we have, uh, uh, since January, a client which, which listed a, a fund focused on food from a biodiversity angle. So uh, a wide uh, set of, of use case, which reflect uh, with, uh, I would say, uh, 10 years uh, gap, the maturity and the evolution of the market that we have seen in other thematics, uh, like uh, climate, uh, with uh, ESR investors, uh, active management, passive management, and even uh, banks are looking at that. Of course, the regula regulatory drivers that you summarize in your report uh, will be a strong accelerator uh, of that uh, of that uh, reality. Yeah, thanks for that mention. At the end, I was going to also ask Ladislas about that. So you, but Matthew, you, Marie, uh, Marie, uh, Marianne, and uh, Ladislas, you're all in France, uh, and the regulators have been a little bit more proactive on these issues, both on disclosure and on and on impacts. Uh, so I am curious how much you think that's moving forward versus how much do you really see sort of investor demand all the way, you know, from institutional investor to retail investor? Uh, what do you think is really driving the desire to, to use more of these tools to improve the availability of the data for the tools uh, and, uh, as a way to make decisions and change decision making? Uh, Ladislas, that's about four questions, but let me turn to you on well, I believe it will be one component of the more global trend uh, around the, the rise of sustainable finance. I'm not sure that we will have a specific uh, rise of biodiversity uh, interest. Well, we will have uh, we have that, but this go in the momentum that we see uh, with the EU Commission uh, putting in place its uh, sustainable finance action plan. Uh, the fact that you have more and more regulation. Uh, so at EU level, at French level, we have a uh, now in the new uh, article 29, I think something like that, uh, some uh, specific point on the um, on biodiversity in the US, they start to look at sustainability with the SEC, for instance, who launched a consultation about uh, climate change, but they started to talk about other indicators in this consultation, which might lead also to biodiversity. So I believe that Financial institution won't have the choice anymore in the in the near future. Well, actually, they don't have the choice already right now. I think that most financial institutions now talk about ESG, and now that they speak about ESG, of course, well, climate change is something that nobody can avoid. But once you have put one step uh, into the room, uh, clearly biodiversity is the next uh, big topic. Uh, we have a multiplication of reports showing that uh, we have this huge collapse of biodiversity. I think the COVID crisis was often also linked to uh, the, 
the collapse of biodiversity, well, of course, it's not that obvious and that straightforward. But even if there is no link with the COVID crisis, uh, we cannot avoid this kind of topic. So it will take time. I think that we have a strong lack of resources and skills internally in the financial world. And uh, actually, this is interesting to see. There is a lot of uh, financial institutions now hiring some specialists about uh, ESG in general and sometimes even uh, on biodiversity. So there is a momentum, there is a lack of resource, it will take a little time, but clearly I do not see anything which will impede this movement to, uh, to grow. The, Marianne, did you want to come back in on, on something on that, sorry? Yeah, I think uh, we can see it since the beginning of the year, because 2021 is the year of biodiversity with all the political agenda and uh, events coming up. But uh, we see a, a very uh, large increase of demands about biodiversity uh, tools, impact measures. And I think for us, we we took uh, we, we take the the party to, to choose to have a global coverage because uh, for biodiversity, we are where we are that climate uh, change uh, 10 years or 15 years ago, we have a, some new metrics. So it's very really hard for and difficult for investors and even for retail uh, investors to understand a ton of CO2. And now you introduce new metrics, so it's very difficult. So that's why when we work with some, um, some clients, we try to have a, a global coverage of their portfolios uh, for asset managers and asset owners, try to give them a range of numbers for impact in MSA and with different uh, uh, range of indicators, but try to say, okay, that's your portfolio compared to benchmark. That's the impact of a company compared to what the sector is doing. And it's very important, try to, uh, as you, you mentioned in terms of recommendation, we try to train, explain, and how you can build a story about your portfolio, about biodiversity, and what's the most, uh, the sectors who are most impacting and what's the contributors of your portfolio. And that's how it's very interesting to work with investors because you can see that's a real uh, commitment and re they are very eager to understand what's going on in biodiversity in that portfolio. So uh, I think it's a, it's a great momentum we can see on the market today. Thank you. I'm collecting a whole list of follow-up questions for you, Karine. Um, I want to add, add one more on this, you know, do we standardize now or do we do we continue to look at the variety of tools? Before I get to that, uh, I want to go to um, Antti and uh, Leonie about um, challenges in developing these tools and uh, the metrics that you pull in, sort of pulling off one of the, one of the points that the previous uh, panelists just raised. Um, and how do you how do you do the aggregation um, of all of the information that you're pulling in because you're looking at ESNG? So you've got the metrics challenge on the first end, and then you've got the inter in integration on the second in the second instance. So over to you, Antti. Yeah, sure. Um, um, so challenges. Well, there there was many. Um, obviously, uh, obviously, and it took it took a long time. Uh, we at some point we calculated that we spend about 80 person years um, at this point at this point in time on, on aggregate on the on the tool set that we currently currently have so so there is a there is some kind of a work to be done i think we we spent uh, much much more on on this kind of a i suppose a traditional change management work a lot of workshops a lot of memos a lot of pilots a lot of going back and forth and a lot of trying to especially we we wanted to be a kind of a, a very culturally sensitive we we are mostly Western European. We know that the uh, and I'm, I've been working in uh, in various different European countries when it comes to asset management. And know that the, the kind of idea of a sustainable development, or idea of an impact, or idea of a good company or a bad company, or responsible behavior, or irresponsible behavior, changes quite quickly, even crossing borders in in, in you, let alone a global model. So so we wanted to kind of bring in bring in a, a synthesis of of everything. Um, SDGs, by the way, help that quite a lot. Not because it's a list of metrics, but because it's a you know, a best thing as a global consensus, what sustainable development means. So it's kind of, it's a kind of a handy tool. So, so there's a lot of that work. I would, um, and there's a lot of engineering work as well. I wouldn't say that the, the data availability was, was as big hindrance as people usually believe. Like, obviously it, it requires time and tools and, and focus and effort and commitment to, to put it together. But the, but I think there's a plenty, plenty uh, more than enough of kind of a raw material there to kind of a build a, build an impact model impact models to kind of put together um i think once 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 the kind of a data side of things and the and the, the, the data science of it comes together i think asset management industry at at large has a quite wide tool set already 
available on how kind of a traditional risk management investment investment risk management is conducted like how risk is attributed to different investment decisions on how the uh, how kind of a portfolio um, attributes are decomposed um, and how particular uh, investment security characteristics then are kind of aggregated on a portfolio level or and those on so we we do we do uh, i think the esg specific stuff is the is the one that that we did on the on the esg specific data sets when it comes to be it be it gender diversity or gender pay cap or carbon emissions or water or, and so on but once once those data sets are available then then we rely quite heavily on the on what the asset management business is already quite good at so you know in a way that the moment that you can you can kind of translate in inherently a qualitative issue into quantitative numbers like this these kind of a paragraphs into um, excel files and and bullet points then then the asset management uh, industry kind of a kicks in and there's a plenty of tools that that can be used at that point do you worry when you are putting that together do you worry because of that the force of gravity if you will what happens if you pick the wrong indicator yeah it's a it's a uh, and i suppose I, I go back to this kind of workshop we were very cognizant of the of the whole whole, whole idea and we we definitely kind of recognize the responsibility over choosing choosing a metrics and therefore again the sdgs were useful the workshops were were useful and um, and so on so yeah there is a there is a kind of a responsibility i think that everybody everybody in the industry plays in in kind of making sure that's also links by the way we talked about the um uh, the report recommendation to to science and the scientific method i from our point of view that since we are investors also as 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 we are data providers so it's paramount importance for us to be correct rather than be a very very flashy or, or or salesy so we do rely quite quite a lot on, on on the scientific method not because it's a scientific method but it's by far the best way of of coming to a, a correct answer or right uh, right answer so so yeah it, it plays a big big role in in in, in in selecting the indicators and what do we what does one do with the indicators mm -hmm. um leonie i want to uh, turn to you on um the uh, first on the what do you think about the current status of the metrics you know following on, on on this conversation and also this the complexity versus what you put forth in the opening as a really pretty simple question which is you know does my portfolio do harm or does my portfolio do good <laughs> how do you when you're working through the complications of the metrics themselves the data and then the aggregation into a tool um, to make sure that you're still really fundamentally answering that that question for an investor who cares is my is my investment doing harm or good yeah, uh, well, uh, we strongly believe that that um, that the framework will develop over the over the coming period, huh? and also that the impact uh, uh, impact metrics itself will also improve over the years. Uh, and um, well, we look at six themes within uh, the sustainable investment framework, and we have not only defined what can be measured today. Uh, but um, the the academics at uh, at Cambridge University also defined what the ideal measure would look like. Uh, so, for example, if you uh, look at climate stability, which is one of the themes right now, uh, we can uh, we use scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but we're aiming for degrees Celsius uh, to be the metrics. And um, well, there's a lot of research done on these kind of topics. So CISL will publish a report in uh, July uh, on this. Um, so uh, based on the intensive research done by CISL, but also the trends and developments, the, the alignment with law and regulations like the EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan, uh, have, we expect the metrics in our navigator to definitely uh, will that they will improve over time. That's that's for sure. Uh, and also because uh, we really created a starting point. Uh, and yeah, there is dependency on what's possible today with regard to the data availability. Uh, but we expect that uh, the EU taxonomy and the CSRD uh, and these kind of initiatives will be of help in the future. Yeah. 
Thanks. You know, there's a there's a, a great question in the Q and A that a couple of you, if you might want to answer it on the side on where is the further deep research needed and what questions should we be prioritizing for uh, to hack with university partners? Uh, and several of you have kind of mentioned this. If you wanna drop responses to that question, uh, that's, that's a pretty interesting question. Now, um, Karina, I wanna turn to you. Um, the, the, the tool that you use has a holistic impact methodology. How do you incorporate you know, both the positive and the negative impacts into the assessment? How do you systematically consider environmental, social, economic development concerns? Because you're mo looking at this much bigger question of, of SDGs, um, you know, to the earlier point about sometimes missing the, the freshwater marine issues. How do you think about this in <laughs> quite complicated set of questions together? Thanks, Margaret. Um, yes, indeed. Um, I think at, uh, at Unipify and the, the methodology that um, that we've been trying to uh, to develop is uh, has this kind of unique holistic um, dimension to it. I think the there's there's kind of two main aspects of it. Um, on the one hand, it's uh, it's really the notion that we want to understand um, what are the impact areas, topics you might call them sustainability topics that associate themselves to a portfolio. Um, and we want to understand that um, not, you know, kind of by cherry, cherry picking SDGs or topics kind of, you know, where we think <laughs> intuitively um, that there might be some, some nice stories to tell, um, but really to be able to take um, kind of a, around the, uh, the SDG wheel um, approach. And so we've, we've really tried to unpack the SDGs into bespoke and discrete impact areas and topics. Um, and so the, you know, the idea is one really takes a, um, a bit of a, a round view of what it is that associates itself to the portfolio um, for the three dimensions of sustainability. So it's the environmental, it's the social, but it's also economic development. Often we confuse economic with just the notion of returns, but it really is a developmental dimension that's very, very important. Um, and then the second aspect of it is the fact that indeed it has to be looking at positive associations and negative associations. And those associations um, are not mutually exclusive. So it's not about a certain type of activity being either good or bad for um, you know, water resources or good or bad for employment. Um, usually it's a mix of both. And we certainly know that all, all economic activity has both positive and negative aspects. Um, so that's really what we mean by this um, holistic approach. And so um, really the, you know, the, the way we've tried to bring that together is by on the one hand, having a series of mappings that are really grounded in very much mainstream, um, universally used um, resources such as industry classifications um, and, and, you know, kind of the, the science available on, um, on how these different sectors and activities associate themselves to the, uh, to the different sectors and to the different impact, um, impact areas. Um, so it's basically a series of, of impact mappings. And on the other hand, to really create a, a workflow where you're having to map in a very precise way what's inside the, the portfolio. So it's an objective review and it's not based on perceptions or um, I guess just discrete or, or subjective understanding of you know, what, uh, what's in the, in the portfolio. So these are really some of the, the grounding aspects to, to get a, a good holistic picture so that then you can indeed understand what are the main impact areas and also how these topics interact because that's that's really the just the, to finish off Margaret is to say that um, I think we, we need obviously to have a very deep understanding of individual topics and find the right metrics for them and also associate them very clearly to different sectors um, but we do need fundamentally if we want to achieve the SDGs to understand the interconnections between the impact areas, because as long as we try to tackle them individually, um, it's going to be way too expensive and it's going to be way too resource intensive. So unless we understand the connections, we won't be able to leverage them in a positive way. They'll just be a risk factor and something that puts us off. So that's the other reason why this is really important to us.
Uh, so you're 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 talking about this learning process, right? And and obviously there are a variety of tools already available. There are other tools in process. There are as as has come up in um, some of the questions that have come through as well, um, tools that we didn't look at for various reasons. Um, either they don't have a, a portfolio function, or um, they're they're not looking directly at impact, or the coverage is uh, still too narrow. But there's a lot of movement in the space. So how do you think about out, uh, one of you mentioned earlier the um, the need for some industry uh, standardization. Um, how do you think, Karine, about this? Um, the the the, pro, the trade offs between the um, vibrancy of testing and learning and uh, developing new tools with new data. Uh, for different use cases, uh, really, as Matthew uh, mentioned earlier, versus the need for some uh, standardization in the field so that um, investors who are maybe not as sophisticated in these issues don't have the same kinds of resources internally like, like uh, Mihova would have to look really deeply that they can use more off the shelf um, uh, tools if there's better standardization. How do you think about these pros and cons? And I'm, I'm happy to have any of the, the rest of you jump in on this question too, because I think this is a real big question. Kareem, why don't you start? Sure, no, it is It is a very important question. And it's, there's a lot to unpack there. There's different um, aspects really to uh, to harmonization. Um, I you know, first of all, indeed, I think it's it's very positive that there would be that vibrancy and that we are looking at different um, approaches and that there are different use cases. And, we're, you know, the more we tackle this from different angles, the, the better. And that's definitely the case um, where I think there is um, a certain urgency for harmonization. Um, is, I guess, the, the basis of a, of a common language, as it were, for some of the basic aspects. Um, I think when, when we're looking to manage impacts, um, and obviously the, you know, the measurement pieces is one aspect of being able to manage impact. Um, what we do need is, as said that, you know, a bit of a, a common language, at least for the basics. Um, so there are, you know, some things that might sound very pedestrian, but are actually quite key if we're thinking, for instance, of portfolios in, in banks or indeed, um, you know, asset management portfolios, which is indeed how does, you know, how does data get um, classified in the first instance? How do we know which sectors we're lending to or not? And there are probably as many industry classifications as there are um, companies at this point in time. So the first thing in terms of being able to manage and communicate is to harmonize that. And there is such a thing as an international classification code, but it's a, it was not built in an impact um, it wasn't, it's not fit for purpose for impact in most cases, um, and it's been diversified and fragmented everywhere. So this, this again, might sound very pedestrian, but actually is a very important factor. And in a way that's, to me, that's the, you know, the X axis of a two, you know, two, two way chart. The Y axis is the impact areas and topics. While there are many different metrics that will need to associate themselves to specific cases, whether it's sectors, activities, types of assets, geolocation, et cetera. What we can agree on, I think, is the impact areas and topics themselves. We're all calling them slightly different things, or we're looking at things at a generic level, environment, or we're looking at very specific things under that. And so we need some sort of a you know, taxonomy of sustainability topics as well. So those areas, I think, is where we need a commonality and probably faster would be better. Yeah, thanks for that. One, just one re reflection uh, from my own part for having done some of this in the past, uh, even before WWF, and th this is very much an interdisciplinary discussion. Um, and you run into really simple things like, you know, land isn't a sector in the way that in the way that the finance industry thinks and the way that the data comes in. Um, but, but you know, what we're interested in from an environmental perspective, obviously is, you know, impacts on land. Uh, so you have that, you have those kinds of translation challenges also that, that come into play when you're trying to both define the metrics and pull them together in turn, in, into a tool. Uh, Ladislas, over to you and then to uh, Leonie. About this uh, standardization question, well, maybe two thoughts about that. First uh, reaction is that uh, one of our strong beliefs at Mirova is that we have to pay attention to not develop only methodology, but to develop database. Uh, if we want financial institutions to use 
biodiversity data, if you come to them only with a great methodology standard and that they will have to apply by, that by themselves on uh, thousands of companies, honestly, it's almost uh, meaningless. And uh, this is why actually we launched the RFP that uh, I don't remember if it was Mathieu or Marianne mentioned, I think it was Mathieu, uh, because we saw that there was some, a lot of development around methodology, but not so much people thinking about, well, developing some database uh, on the large set of issuers that can be used by, um, by, by investors and by financial institutions. So from my perspective, more than standardization, we need this thinking around uh, building uh, some uh, database on large set of issuers. The second thought for me is that I don't believe that uh, standardization is such a strong issue, actually. Uh, let's say that we have uh, two, three, four, five data providers with slightly different uh, approaches. Is it that an issue? I'm not so sure. My strong conviction is that what we need to agree on rather than a strict methodology is more some key principles. And among the principles that we push very hard at Mirova is the first the idea that any assessment, any sustainability assessment, and of course biodiversity assessment should be done through a life cycle approach. Any uh, assessment uh, looking only at direct impact, uh, scope one and scope two, when we talk about climate change usually, but same thing on biodiversity and same thing on other topic. Honestly, it does not make a lot of sense. If you look at the uh, biodiversity footprint of a company, of a fast food uh, restaurant chain, for instance, if you are not looking at the supply chain, you missed uh, the full, full point. Same thing if you are looking at the chemicals company, providing some, uh, selling some uh, fertilizers and uh, some uh, other chemical products. If you are not looking at the use phase, again, you are missing the, the bulk of the issue. So that's, for instance, one of the principles that I think is really important. Second principle, People which you already discussed, the idea that you do not need to look only at the negative side of the impact, but also to look at the positive side of the impact, because otherwise the temptation for a financial company to reduce its biodiversity, to improve its biodiversity rating would be only to divest from sectors with a strong uh, biodiversity footprint and, for instance, invest only in uh, IT companies or uh, I don't know, some companies with low impact on, on biodiversity, while actually what we need is not only to divest from uh, agricultural sectors or infrastructure sector, but to build uh, some new ways of uh, growing food, to, uh, so to find new ways to live in the cities, etc. And uh, that's uh, one of the, the key principles. And uh, agreeing on this kind of key principle for me is the bulk of what we, the industry needs rather than some strong standardization because we are still at the early stage of the development of this market and we do we should not put some uh, limit to innovation and to uh, and actually i think it would be a pity to have only one or two data providers with using exactly the same methodology we need a variety of uh, players to, to choose and, uh, and take the best one uh, when we are uh, someone who might buy that uh, on the market and well, um, thanks for that leonie over to you on this question too yeah, I know that there are a lot of challenges, eh? <laughs> not only on impact measurement, but also on standardization and harmonization. Uh, but I think it's it's important that at least we should try. <laughs> and uh, the main reason is uh, if we have the end investor uh, in mind, uh, it's so difficult uh, to see whether your portfolio is doing harm or good. And at least um, if, if you keep in mind the, the, the buyers or the, the from for investment funds or the participants of a of a pension, uh, 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 if you keep the uh, people in mind, for us it's it's totally clear what we're talking about. But it must you must be able as an end buyer of an investment fund or a participant of a of a pension fund to make the distinguish between several investments and to make the to see the difference between what's what's going okay and what's not going okay and you can only create it if we all use the same kind of metrics or all use the same kind of um, methodologies behind it uh, otherwise there will be so much going on and people won't see the trees through the wood i'm not sure if that's the right expression we have that in the, in the Netherlands. so um for me it's it's really important and i, I would like to welcome you all to work together and, and and let's see how we can create something for for uh, generations to come 
I think that's good. Not seeing the forest for the trees is is a oh, very okay. good <laughs> is a very good analogy. And sometimes we spend so much time on individual leaps, uh, we might really we might really get lost. Um, Matthew, I, I want to come to you on this question, um, sort of on the standardization and the use case as well. And I think you mentioned earlier the um, the different investment strategies, whether it's an active or a passive investment strategy. Obviously, the stronger the metrics, the more standardized maybe the the um, easier it is for a passive investment strategy in particular um, because you could just set against a benchmark or set a bench of men, uh, against a metric are we one year from that are we 10 years from that uh, and what do you think the the demand is in terms of the you know development of standardization in this space and the you know pros and cons of we as we've talked about uh, on those standards Thank you, Margaret. Um, I think the signals that we can deliver are, are um, mature enough to, to have a, a sound merit order and, and capture the materiality in some sector and some financial pairs are, are willing to use that and to design strategy around that. Uh, however, uh, I fully agree with, uh, with uh, what Ladislas mentioned. Uh, at this point of the industry, uh, we, we should not uh, push very hard to have a, a common and standardized approach uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, biodiversity metrics, because what, what we need first and foremost is innovation and innovation will come from a competition. So, so we should embrace it and uh, be more afraid than of a lack of, you know, competition uh, offers uh, around that because again we, we need innovation at the same time it's true that we need standardization I, I would say at two different levels the first one is uh, regulator will are and will continue to uh, ask uh, for reporting uh, and at the same time uh, I think that minimum standards in terms of uh, scopes what Ledislas mentioned, huh, the, the scope, the scope free, uh, and in terms of covered coverage, what kind of, of pressures, uh, change of land use, uh, GAG uh, pollutants, and so on, are included or not into the reporting, to make sure that uh, no one is sending misleading signal. I think that from a capital reallocation standpoint, the, that's very important. And the second angle where standardization uh, is very important is that such as uh, we have a, a directive on, on financial data, uh, which uh, created standards in terms of financial reporting. Uh, we should have standardization in terms of uh, environmental reporting from the corporates. In other words, have a data lake or, or it will more looks like a data ocean with very standardized uh, data coming from the corporate, allowing from a, a set of academics, financial institutions, service and data providers to leverage on that and, and to design science-based, sound, accessible, uh, simple, easy to use and so on uh, solution. And, and, and that I think is uh, what the EU is, is working at by the way, and, uh, and very important because there will be and there will continue to be contrasted view about what is more material, what should be prioritized and so on and so on. That is a, an innovation driver, but there should not be any kind of difference of judgment on uh, an information like what is the business of a mining company where its assets are located, and so on. That kind of factual information should be standardized, normalized and standardized. And thanks for that. The principles um, focus for the top and then the normalization, standardization, very helpful. I want to ask uh, Sam and Joanne to uh, come back with us for for a bit. Um, I've been trying to pull in some of the questions that have come from the audience. I want to go to Auntie um, first and then 
um, on a particular question. And then uh, Sam and Joanne, um, both for your reactions to the conversation. And then if you want to pick up some of the questions that have come through the, the um, Q's and A's, um, onto to this question of, of, uh, of the data challenge, um, what do you think needs to be what do you think needs to be addressed? Where are the biggest challenges? Uh, if if you could if you could fix one thing, you know, in all of the all of the uh, uh, work that you've done so far and pulling in uh, data, identifying the metrics, maybe thinking about these principles and and the norms, uh, what do you think needs uh, the most attention right now? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and I think uh, Matthew already kind of touched this touched uh, about this a bit. I, I think. Most of the kind of, a, particularly on a portfolio level, but even any external observer is, is a little bit the mercy of the company themselves disclosing disclosing um, accurately their um, their operations, their products and services mixes, and and how they conduct their business and so on. So it's it's regardless of whether you're a service provider or academic researcher or anybody else. If you're an outsider for that particular company, then it's very difficult to come up with a very very accurate accurate assessment, and and you then you need to rely on proxies or secondary sources and, and when you do that then error gets introduced and when the error gets introduced then then you know it's not it's not optimal so i would first first and foremost i would i would like to see that 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 low level um normalization and standardization when, when it comes to corporates uh, publishing publishing the information and um, particularly not not necessarily on on kind of even a, even a very high level metrics of of do they have a board level responsibility over biodiversity? But very, very simple stuff. Where do they have their plants? What what's their production capacity? Where exactly they they are in terms of of coordinates? Um, and then uh, and then their products and mix um, services. Like in, for a pharmaceutical companies, for example, their biodiversity impact impact um, um in their in their waste management differs greatly depending on what is it exactly that they do. And this goes back to what Karin was saying earlier about the industry taxonomies in a way that they, it's kind of a funny that. The companies themselves, they kind of a, try very, very hard not to be comparable in a way. They have an incentive to try, try to be as different from one another. And then there's an industry like people like us try to come up with the industry taxonomies, which is a, effectively an exercise of ramming a, a round back to a square hole <laughs> to, to a certain degree. But it has to be done in order to in order to um, in order to kind of do a full and complete complete assessment. But I would I would place it a, a lot of that to corporates. I would also think that the, that's where the regulation comes in, because regulation has the regulation uh, stifles uh, uh, innovation, but it has the it has the ability to empower um, the uh, the the lowest or lowest or the, the late starters and, and to begin begin the journey. And we need we not we need not only the the quality of the ESG data or quality of the of the biodiversity data, we need the quantity as well. And that quantity, I think, comes only through the regulation. Uh, thanks for that. I want to go, uh, Joanne and uh, Sam. Um, I want to get your uh, give you each a couple minutes um, your reflections on the conversation, the discussion, the feedback, and maybe if there are any particular questions that have come through uh, that you want to address related to the report. Um, Joanne, do you want to go first? I will ask Sam to go first. Actually, Sam, <laughs> over to you, Sam. All right, uh, ball a buck successfully passed. Um, I, I think it's been a, a fantastic discussion. I, I think a lot of the, you know, the deeper issues that Joanne and I were talking about when we were putting together this report, you know, are, are you know, there, we didn't resolve any of them because these are all live issues and they don't have easy answers. Uh, the standardization one, uh, certainly that's something that we've been talking about. Um, I completely agree with, um, with the point, you know, my general sense is, regulation does need to be a driver of of a certain amount of standardization if only to get the momentum behind um you know a nascent disclosure regime going and we've seen that you know with with uh you know the with france and the or i think it's i can never remember the number of the article in france it's 173 or, or something like that um you know we saw that with with france we see that with you know the regulatory drivers from uh, a bunch of the eu sustainability related mandates uh, and and that is you know the effects of that and the taxonomy are, are spreading out into um uh, into the broader investor 
uh, population, not just in Europe, but also around the world for, for companies that want to market in, in Europe. So uh, that sort of regulatory push, I think, is very helpful. Um, but I also agree that, you know, right now we're, we're still at a relatively early stage. So the, 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 the different companies have different approaches to, you know, to mining the data, to, to you know, processing it and, and, and coming up with, 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 with how things look. So I, I agree that, you know, right now we're sort of at a sort of a careful balance point for, um, for how we address the standardization. You know, maybe you go with principles-based standards rather than, you know, specifically, def- you know, you, you have to have your, your square shaped with, you know, two centimeters on a side of a box. You don't want to be overly prescriptive. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, but that's that's sort of how I think the 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 industry should be developing. Um, I also think that between the biodiversity specific tools and the um, the uh, the more holistic tools, which tend to be much more directly plugged into the existing ESG uh, disclosure regime, they are they're they're in very different places with respect to you know data availability, availability quantity, quality, and um, and how how they can be used. Um, you know when I talked to Impact Cube. Uh, to one of uh, Auntie's colleagues at Impact Cube, you know, they say we'd love to do biodiversity, but there is no data um, because that's not part. You know, data related to biodiversity isn't that isn't really a part of the ESG disclosure regime. So, um, so it you know how the regulatory um, push impacts the different tools will also depend on which kind of tool you're talking about as well. And I think for biodiversity, it's a it's a, a younger uh, population set that uh, maybe needs a bit more of a push. Uh, I can comment on that. Thank you, Sam, for, for that. Um, I, on the standardization point, I, I would like to um, highlight this example report that WWF published about, I think it was last year. So it was about the water sector. And there are three tools that you know a lot of people, investors are familiar with. One is WWF's water risk filter. The other is WRI's aqueduct. And the other is or Business Council for Sustainable Finance, uh, Sustainable Development, India Water um, Tool Filter. Um, so of these three, what we found, all of them, you know, as they were talking together, is that investors actually do need to understand the, the, the definitions and the language and taxonomy used in the tools to be the same. Otherwise, they're very confused. So they got these complaints from the user side. And at the same time, they under, uh, realized that actually they're using somewhat similar databases when, when it goes back to the fundamental sources of the, their data. So what they, what they did together is they talked to each other and then they decide to share the data together. So they are, you know, they're working off from the kind of a um, holistic, mutually agreeable terms and, and languages and if possible metrics. So while they do that, they also, I think, dis- discussed and agreed that, okay, for you, WWF, you, your strengths lie in this and this dysfunction. So keep that in your tool. So, you know, push that and we'll, whenever we get questions on that, we'll bring those clients to you. And whereas WRI, you do other functions. So I think they managed to set the common database to work together so that it's easier for the users, but at the same time, differentiate their functions and offerings to the clients so they can also ha- all have their, keep their share of market share or clients. So I think that was a good example that, that you know, we tried to do in the water tool space. So I'm hoping that something like this, you know, I'm not saying that all the tools should be the same or anything. I don't think it's pos- even possible, but I think at, at, as you mentioned that, you know, having the same principles or agreeable principles and, you know, starting to use the same language uh, or using um, um, agreed definitions on this front would be really useful. Uh, maybe not now, but you going forward, this will be much more becoming, it, this will become much more important. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a, a great way to get to the final question. I'm going to give each of you about uh, 30 seconds on the final question. And, and just one note, a number of you in different ways have mentioned that you need the corporates to do geolocation disclosure. Uh, and that certainly is a, a key to then applying some of the biodiversity data that is available because it's all about the where. Um, but if you don't have the disclosure where the assets are, it's really hard to do that combination. So I just want to flag because that's coming up. That, that has come up in a couple of the points that you all have made and also in some of the questions. Um, so the final question, I just want to uh, run around the room on this. You know, what's next? <laughs> what do you see coming in impact measurement uh, at the portfolio level in the next uh, three to five years? So maybe, Marianne, if I could start back up with you. 
Um, well, thanks, Margaret. Well, uh, there's still a lot of room of improvement because we are still waiting for some uh, international targets. Like we, we saw the one, uh, like this binding agreement at the COP21 to have this Paris Agreement of uh, two degrees. Um, but they were expecting something likewise for, for biodiversity that will help to understand what's the targets, what's the ambition. Uh, it was a big push for climate, so maybe uh, with uh, with the COP uh, in China, we will have uh, some more guidelines about the international community. Uh, we are working as well on some um, dependency score uh, with the Encore methodology because uh, we can see that it's interesting to have this assessment of the full value chain, the scope one, two, and three on climate. We apply that on biodiversity as well, but. There's always these interdependencies between the sectors, and it's interesting to, for biodiversity, is even more uh, interesting to have this analyzed. So, uh, so the next step is that to interrogate more and more um, targets, ambitions, try to get more data, this asset level data, as you mentioned. We, we of course, we have the localization of uh, the activity of a company, but uh, the more the, the corporate reports, uh, the more uh, they report on their biodiversity strategy, the more we can say something about uh, the corporates and uh, its impacts and footprints. So, uh, of course, there will be both like regulators, uh, the international communities and the corporates. If you want to move towards the same goal, we will have uh, more accurate data to work on. Yeah, great. Karim, what's next? Sorry, that was for me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, a lot. Um, I think the, uh, you know, what's uh, in terms of some of what was said now around um, harmonization and, you know, trying to have some elements of, of common language and common principles, um, Unipify is part of a, a network of, um, I guess, principles and standard setters around sustainability and impact. Um, initiatives called the IMP Structured Network. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, to delivering some, uh, some, yeah, I guess some, some elements that maybe the, the wider um, community can then also be engaged on later this year. So that's, I think, an interesting development. I think also more from a regulatory perspective, the points that were made in terms of, you know, almost saying that before we even look at extra financial data, it's the financial and, and basic data that needs to be right. So what are companies doing and where are they doing it? Um, so I think be interesting to see how certain, um, you know, certain processes that have just starting, like the set of a sustainability standards board, um, can perhaps, you know, help us um, along this, uh, you know, drive this, and also just generally drive the notion, as uh, as Joanne was saying at the beginning, that you know, impact um, measurement and analysis needs to become uh, a mainstream thing. Um, and otherwise, I guess from you know, I said we're also looking forward to, to the next um, uh, the next um, item in the in the suite of impact analysis tool being released next week which is one for investment portfolios so, but again congratulations for uh, for the for the excellent report and for convening us today that's great thank you uh, very much um, auntie let me go to you next what's next yeah sure well um, I would very much, very much kind of agree with and and, and take it where where Karin, uh, Karin left off. I have a reason to say this, but the, but I, I think this quantification is very much happening within the within the impact measurement. Like it's still way too acceptable, and not only in impact, but the ESG at, at last for 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 investors, investors and companies to engage in short storytelling and tell that you know we we have we've done this, so therefore everything is everything is rosy. This doesn't happen in the in the standard asset management anymore uh, like you can't describe a good risk as asset management as a, as a as a as a good standard with the giving and giving us one single anecdotal example it has to be numbers and it has to be quantifiable it's the same thing is uh, hopefully it's going to happen in the impact measurement where you know there's going to be hard numbers hard um, hard statistics um uh, that that thing and uh, people like us and everybody else who cares about the impact measurement can take it forward uh, forward uh, quantitatively so yeah that's thanks. the future thanks matthew Thank you, Margaret. Very rapidly, I would say uh, that the, the next uh, milestone for us is uh, positive impact. We are working on that with uh, with our partner, ICANN Consult, with our scientific committee. Uh, Let's last uh, remind you the importance of that kind of KPI. It should be approached with caution, 
to avoid greenwashing. And it's even more important in that field that, unlike for climate, you may have direct investment into natural capital, which uh, preserve or restore uh, biodiversity. So a lot of, uh, of work to be done uh, around that, and we are working on it. That's great, and maybe uh, helped by a global goal for nature, as was uh, mentioned earlier. Leonie, over to you, and then Ladislas will give you the last word. Yeah, thank you. It, it's difficult. It's a difficult journey, uh, and I think that everyone agrees on that. Uh, and I always compare it with IFRS. It's the accounting standard. It has taken us decades before we could all agree on what net revenues a suitable uh, would be. And I think that uh, this is comparable, uh, but we're, 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 we're doing great. And I'm not afraid that if we are going to harmonize that uh, we won't be uh, uh, innovative uh, enough. I do believe that uh, having such brains, even in, in this panel will be of great help. We all have our thoughts and ideas. So I'm not afraid that uh, harmonization will, um, well, put us down. And I, I, as I said, I always compare it with IFRS and we've done a great job in the last decade. So I'm sure that we will in the future as well on, on this topic. Nice, hopeful point. Let us last to you, what's next? Well, maybe what's next is not about data, but uh, well, actually, if you look at the biodiversity, the bulk of biodiversity lost is related to our food system, I believe. And actually, when you use biodiversity a measurement tool, uh, well, it can help, but uh, this tool usually focuses on large corporations, which usually have only indirect connection with farms and food production system uh, within their supply chain. And so if we want financial institutions to have a more positive impact on biodiversity, well, maybe they can divest from a business with strong negative uh, biodiversity impact, but if we want them to invest in more positive business, it will not be about uh, bringing some new data, but it will be about to find new ways to finance innovative farming, farming practices uh, directly at a project level. We try to do that at Mirova. We believe that there is a need to really strongly increase this kind of uh, activity at Mirova, of course, but uh, also uh, around the industry. And so if you tell me what's next, I think that uh, data is great, but it's not the only thing that we should think about. Uh, thank you very much for that good reminder at the end. What a great discussion. I want to thank all our panelists, uh, Maria, Mathieu, Ladislas, Anti, Karin, uh, Leonie, for joining us. Thank you, Joanne and Sam, for the report and all the work behind it, including uh, bringing us all together today. Uh, and I want to thank each of you for joining us and encourage you to keep up this conversation. I think this is the year we hope we can turn the corner on COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic and rebuild in a way that leads us more resilient environmentally, socially, economically uh, to the next crisis uh, and finding ways to identify nature positive uh, investments and uh, have fewer nature negative investments. Uh, in particular, the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure should help us get some uh, disclosure recommendations. This is really good impact for that, uh, input for that conversation over the next couple of years. Thank you all very much uh, for doing your important part in delivering delivering on the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is thriving people on a healthy planet. Thanks all for watching us uh, and uh, for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your evening, afternoon, or morning. Thank you all. Bye. Hello.